Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason. Today, we're bringing back to the show Mark Erickson. Mark, how you doing? Doing pretty good. Excited to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited to have you back. It is always a blast having you on the show. Uh, I feel like I always learn a lot just being in your general vicinity. Um, folks who aren't familiar with you and your work, do you want to give us a bit of a, a background on who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, so currently, uh, job-wise, I'm a senior front-end engineer at Replay, where we're building a time-traveling debugger for JavaScript, and we'll talk, be talking about that plenty over the course of this show. Uh, most folks probably know me as either the guy who shows up anytime the word Redux is mentioned online, or that guy with the Simpsons avatar. Mm -hmm. And and that is, I mean, I think you have probably the most consistent avatar game of anybody I know. Um, and yep, comments on uh, on you being from space. What's uh, is that the norm? It's a it's, it's a it's a it's a it's a Mass Effect spaceship background. Ah, uh, cool. Okay, <laughs> everyone's very excited about this. <laughs> um yeah so so briefly uh the last time you were on the show we talked about redux and mm -hmm. uh it was great because i think that that episode was was a very good one i think um because it just helped me it helped me at least dispel some some beliefs that i had about what redux was or is mm -hmm. um and and what it's actually you know kind of capable of with modern stuff, which I thought was was wonderful. Um, are we using? Are we doing anything with Redux today? Is that is that something we're uh, not? There will be just a little bit. Um, part of I want. Part of what I want to get through is talking about like how do you approach debugging JavaScript in the real world, and that mm. does include like a little bit of like React and Redux specific concepts. Right, but for right. once, Redux is not the focus today, and I'm actually pretty happy about that. <laughs> All right, I won't talk about it anymore. So let's talk instead about uh, Replay, or I guess before we talk about Replay, let's talk a little bit about just the the high level. Um, when you when I reached out to you to see what you wanted to talk about, you said time travel debugging, and so this is the mm. sort of thing that you know. I feel like that's a concept that I have heard thrown around and something that we've seen in sort of esoteric demos. Um, I know that that was one of the core promises way back in the day with uh, even things like Redux was was sort of like, hey, this mm -hmm. is this enables time travel. And I've been doing this, it's what, 10 years since uh, since all this started and I still don't know what it means. So can you, can you mm -hmm. explain time travel? Uh, to someone like me who is is uh, currently stuck in the present. Sure. <laughs> so I I do actually want to get into talking about just like debugging in general in yeah. just a second. But let's 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 talk about the time travel thing for a second. So one of the basic truisms about both life and debugging is that things only move forward. Mm -hmm. You can't go back and change what ha what's happened. And you know it's it's that it's that bit from Spaceballs about you know when now, and and so like when like if if you're debugging something, you know you've maybe you've got a breakpoint somewhere you're paused, and you hit step next step next you see a value step next whoops I just went too far, and now you probably have to go back and you know reload the entire program mm -hmm. maybe do some fiddling with the breakpoints get back to the area that you were looking at, step, 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 and now you're back at the point in time that you actually care about. And it's very easy to either miss the piece that's interesting or have to do a lot of work to set that back up. And the, the basic broad picture of time travel debugging is if we have some way to rewind time or capture everything that's happened, you don't have to go through all that setup and you know getting back to where you were. You can go to any point in time mm. and you can see what's happened. And it's, you know, again, like depending on whether you're using you know Redux or Replay or you know various other tools that have some more features, you can basically go to any point in time that's interesting and see what's going on. 
Mm. And you can see how things change over time rather than just their current value wherever that you're paused. You know, like, like, like with Redux, we've got the Redux dev tools right. and you can see both the history of the actions that got dispatched and for each one, you can see what the action object contained. You can see what the state looked like after it was done processing, mm -hmm. but you can also see how the state changed as a result of that action being dispatched. And in the case of replay, because we, you know, it's basically like a DVR recording of your application for you know a couple minutes at a time, you can go to any line of code you can see how many times did that line of code run. You can see what the variables were every time that line of code ran. Mm -hmm. You can add print statements that print out what it would have logged if you had a log statement in the code originally. And you can, you can get this sense of the progression of the program that you wouldn't have if you were trying to step through things yourself. That is extremely cool. Um, and honestly, oh, yeah. it sounds like it sounds too good to be true. <laughs> That's the, it's the sort of thing that I hear that. And I'm like, yeah, great. If you, sh if you showed me that in a, in a sci-fi book, I would suspend my disbelief enough to, to say, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, but it feels like that, that's just, that's such an impressive thing to be doing, you know, thinking about the, the mm -hmm. idea that you said a DVR recording of what's happening, um, that's very cool. Uh, so my my curiosity then is around in in debugging in general, like you know, as you were you were sort of painting your your picture of what it's like to debug without replay. Um, even that was maybe a little more advanced than someone like me because you were mm -hmm. mentioning things like breakpoints. I don't I don't use breakpoints. I'm a console log ride or die, you know, and and mm -hmm. <laughs> that has been a, a a pretty like significant source of maybe pain is the the right word, like making things just more complicated for me than they need to be. Mm -hmm. Um and so so let's talk kind of in the abstract about debugging because for someone like me and in the roles that I have worked in, I have always been able to figure out a way to get by in what I think is the equivalent of like hitting a rock with a stick in terms of mm -hmm. my debugging. And, and I never really learned like the tools or the craft of it. Um, where, you know, you, you are clearly like on the other end of the spectrum. So I don't know, let's talk debugging. What's your, what's your worldview on this? Happily. I, I have opinions on this. <laughs> Okay, so big picture, debugging can be boiled down to like, why is this broken mm -hmm. and how do I fix it? Right. And I, I think you actually brought up a very good point, which is that most people, frankly, don't know how to debug. Yeah. Or if they do know how to debug, it's only because they've, they have years and years of general programming experience. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that they've spent time debugging and they've kind of learned it the hard way. And frankly, I think I think this is a really bad reflection on our industry as a whole. We spend lots of time teaching people how to program. Mm -hmm. We spend lots of time teaching people how to use, you know, library X or tool Y. From what I've seen, there's very little emphasis put, you know, either within companies or courses or whatever about how to debug. Right. And yeah, if you think about it, we we spend a ton of time debugging and either like and like we're sort of flailing in the dark without actually like having a like a scientific approach to what we're doing. Yes. So like I think one of the best things that almost anyone can do for their own career is to spend time trying to learn how to debug effectively. And it's it's kind of like learning to code. Like you know, I, I often say that when you're learning to code, you're learning three things. You're learning how to look at a problem statement and break it down, mm -hmm. how to describe a series of steps to solve those problems, and then how do I express those in terms of, of a particular programming language. And the first two are just about thinking. They're not even about writing the code right. at all. 
So debugging is much the same way. Most of debugging is learning about how to think through the problems mm -hmm. and have a scientific approach to tackling them. And then you get into the nitty gritty details of using specific tools. But most mm -hmm. of it is really in your head. And so I, I do think that it's a skill that most people can intentionally learn and practice and apply, and, and they really should. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a really valid point too about you know I think we we focus sometimes really heavily on the specifics of the tools, and I think that that has led to a little bit of a um, like a gold rush mentality. Like we're we're looking for a tool that will magically solve all of our problems, and the the biggest problem with software is that people don't build the right mental models around it. They don't mm. learn to think together as a team. Most of the tech that, that I've seen isn't because somebody was right or somebody was wrong. It's because two people were building the same tool from completely different mental models and they weren't compatible. And like they didn't take the time to learn how to think together. So no amount of tooling in the world was going to save them. And I, I think that leads to some of the heavier handed tooling that we see. Like if you, if you look at something like Angular that's almost entirely driven by code gen, I, I think that that ends up being a way of it's enforcing a, a, a mental model by saying, use mm. the CLI, it will think for you. Um, and then you you kind of have to build within the, the tight boundaries of like, this is the module that was generated for you. You have to like use these APIs, but don't touch anything else or the whole thing falls down. Um, and and I think that that at a certain point is is sort of what I saw the early days of Redux becoming, and as it was, I, I, mm -hmm. I said I wasn't going to talk about Redux, but, <laughs> but it, it, it felt very a, a little digression. Digression's these, okay. You you would throw these these very like prescriptive, like it must be exactly like this, and you need Funk, and you need Saga, and you need this and that, and and it wasn't about it wasn't thinking about programming. It was it was trying to like put these very prescriptive things in place, and when you dug into why. There was the programmer who was trying to force everybody to think like them and everybody else who was handed a system and then they they just mm -hmm. used it because that was the system um and and in debugging it's it's sort of the same thing like the better your mental model is of, of the, the problem space the the more you can reason about what's happening and have an idea of where to go um and then i think what you're talking about with with tooling and like Tooling is sort of the thing that happens after you know what you're trying to understand, and then you can get better or worse visibility based on the tools you choose. So in my case, I'm like whacking on it with a hammer. And in your case, you've got more like surgical tools to actually dig in there mm -hmm. and see exactly what's happening. Uh, <laughs> and if you're, you're saving uh, significantly more cycles because, you know, for me, like my approach to debugging has always been move the console log up one step until you find the place where it broke. Mm -hmm. Um, which is clearly like it is very wasteful, and in certain sufficiently complex systems, it like oh, I'm just guessing. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So, so I am. I'm really excited to see to see more about how you're doing this. Um, so, when you're talking about building a mental model of of debugging, though, or, or like learning to think about debugging, mm -hmm. how have you found that to be different from from like software because these are clearly like two different skill sets hmm. right like i can build code and never debug it <laughs> yeah so the the mental model thing really really is a key thing so like if, if we say that debugging is something's wrong that implies that you know what it should be doing in the first place hmm. so in really in order to even debug effectively at all you have to have a decent idea of what is intended correct behavior. Now, it, it could be as simple as like I press the button and sparkles light up instead of the entire program exploding. Or it could be like there's there's 15 different architectural you know, layers to this application and they interact in this way and the data is being passed from here to there. And this piece is supposed to run before that piece. But you have to have an understanding of what the system is supposed to do in the first place and how the pieces are supposed to fit together to then look at the actual behavior and say, this piece is wrong mm -hmm. because it doesn't match what it's supposed to be doing. Mm 
so that's that's kind of like a step zero is you have to have a decent enough idea of what the intended behavior is to kind of isolate down and say, well, this piece doesn't match up with what I think it's supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of your prerequisite. Yeah. OK, yeah, that that definitely makes sense. Um, and so I think the 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 other pieces that are really interesting when you talk about time travel debugging is that what we're what we're doing as engineers when we build a piece of software is we're we're oftentimes telling a robot do something hundreds or thousands of times and we have like as you said a model of what's supposed to be happening where i know i'm going to pull something from a, a rest api and then i'm going to run some operations against it to change that data into a shape that's that's what i need right and mm. that makes some assumptions about what the rest api is going to send me i am assuming that the data comes back in this shape with these values and i think this one's going to be set always and you know i i mm. assume that they'll always have the same data uh if i call the the api over and over again and when you get into these huge data sets my code is running with all of those assumptions built in and until mm. i you know until i explicitly build in all of my edge cases and stuff which you know that can take years nobody does right yeah right <laughs> the first time you assume it's going to work perfectly every time and then the first thing breaks and then you you know you have to figure out when in those thousands of cycles did something actually go wrong and then which mm -hmm. cycle was it what was the thing that went wrong why why did it break and what's the thing that i can do to make it not break next time um, or, you know, is it, is it even my software? Is it, is it that this API is literally sending different data for the same call sometimes? And I need to like, I have a whole different problem to solve. <laughs> yep. Um, so what's interesting about what you're, what you're talking about with this time travel debugging is if we have a, a DVR of, of the last time I ran this program and I can say, okay, instead of me having to console log 10,000 entries, and then dig back through my my terminal history, assuming I can even scroll that far back before my history runs out, right? <laughs> mm. And try to find the one thing that is malformed, uh, or writing a bunch of specific debugging logic to like guess at what might be wrong or or whatever the thing is. I can use something like replay and just roll back the time to to spot check what's going on. Is that mm. is that correct? Pretty much, pretty much, yeah. So let's let's actually take a step back. Um, I, I have a presentation where I've talked about like approaches to debugging and stuff. <clears throat> and in that, I listed out like some high level steps to debug any problem, like your, your basic mm -hmm. algorithm for debugging. So the high level steps are number one, understand the problem description. Like what is it uh, am I even trying to look at? What's the system? Step two you have to be able to reproduce the issue because you know, like, you know, okay, someone reported that it's broken. Does it only happen on their system? Does it happen all the time? Does it only happen on Tuesdays under a blue moon when the, when the, you know, time zone is set to GMT plus three or something like, so you have to be able to reproduce it and see that, yes, it does happen. And that gives you your entry point to, to knowing like, where to look you know if i if i know that part of the reproduction step is flip this checkbox click this tab click the button that starts to tell me what areas of the code are involved and it means that now i can start to look at it and if i you know if i do step too far i can go back and make the same thing happen again it also means that if i think i have a fix i can try those same steps and see if the problem actually goes away this time so understand what your what the problem is, reproduce the issue. Then you get into the scientific method of try to figure out why it's actually broken. So like think about the problem, understand the code, say, I think that this thing is why it's going wrong. And that's that that narrowing down down process. And then you you use your tools, try to identify, you know, the relevant lines, maybe change one thing compare the behavior, et cetera. 
but you have to do it in an intentional way rather than just like randomly changing bits of code and, and hoping it goes away. Just change the one thing. We, we're not supposed to rewrite the whole program. <laughs> I'm learning a lot about myself and how I'm, how I'm wasting time. Hmm. Right now. <laughs> so even, and then even once you have identified what appears to be the problem, it's usually worth trying to go a step further and see like, Maybe this was just a symptom and the actual root cause is somewhere deeper. So like may maybe maybe the bug is, you know, could not read property X of undefined here, but the root cause is, well, yeah, my, my REST data was changing and we didn't validate it sufficiently. So once you have that all figured out, now you try and apply a fix and verify that it works. And that's also where you should be, you know, adding more tests, updating documentation, updating assumptions, and trying to make sure that you've fixed, you know, maybe not just this one bug, but even like an entire category of bugs going forward. Right. So to bring this back to what you're saying, reproducing the, this issue is a very, very critical step early on. Mm -hmm. And part of the advantage of a time travel debugging tool like Replay is that you only have to reproduce the issue once and now you can investigate infinitely as much as you want after the fact mm -hmm. instead of being having to reproduce it every time and you know maybe maybe it only happens under certain weird multi-threaded conditions and you're spending half your time just trying to make it happen again before you can even investigate yeah well i mean that's that's actually like especially when you were talking about time zones um, time-based bugs are a huge source of frustration, uh, or, yeah. you know, if you're doing something with cron jobs or whatever, like being able to have a single reproduction that you can then use to debug from is huge because yeah. I have absolutely written the fake code to like manually set a date to where it needs to be and then mocked all the, and it's awful. It's absolutely awful to go through and do that, that type of work or to like have to wait 12 hours until you're in the right time window where, you know, the 24 hour clock would break it or whatever the thing is. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so that, that in and of itself is, is already something that I can see. I can, I can call back to some times that I've wasted days trying to, Oh, should I, it's, it's time. I gotta go, gotta go debug this thing right now. I'm in the one hour window where it works. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Or, or even somewhere case, you know, someone else sees the bug and it happens on their machine and it doesn't happen on yours. Or someone else did reproduce the bug and they've reported it. And if you've got that recording available, again, especially in the case of replay, they've done the work to reproduce it. And I, as the developer, can just dive in right now and start investigating without having to take the time to reproduce it. Hold on. You just said something that I, I had not considered was possible that has. So you're saying I, it's not me, the developer, who has to reproduce the bug. You're saying that if, if we've got it instrumented properly, then mm -hmm. someone can send me their own reproduction and say, like, this is my session here. And then I don't even have to figure out how to reproduce. I just take theirs and replay it on my computer. Exactly. So oh. QA teams, external users, other developers. I mean, we, we actually do this at Replay all the time. We yeah. use Replay to solve bugs in our own program. And most of our own internal bug reports are accompanied by a Replay where someone else on the team saw it was broken and they file it. And then I, you know, I can pick it up later and, and see what they were looking at. That's okay. That is, is really cool. Okay. So I, I feel like one of the things that's hard about this show is that I, I love these abstract discussions of, mm -hmm. yeah. about programming and stuff. And also, I really want to see it in action. So I, I, I want to mm -hmm. talk about this forever. But I think in the interest of time, I want to switch us yep. over to... Uh, I, I was about to say that. <laughs> so let's, let's tell you what, let's, let's take about 15-ish minutes and let's just talk general debugging tools, like not even replay yet, okay. but just like what tools are available right now that users should probably be familiar with. Okay. Um, so if you can pull up, uh, let's say, 
let's go with like the the React and Redux code sandbox link that I say oh, I got you. Uh, in yeah. the middle of the the example app section. Let me get over uh, which one? This one here. Okay, so before before we jump into the code, let me do a quick shout out. We've got live captioning happening. Um, thank you so much to White Coat Captioning. And I'm so sorry, I just forgot who's here with us today. It is Maggie. Thank you, Maggie, so much for being here. Um, that is made possible through the support of our sponsors. We've got Netlify, NX, New Relic, and Pluralsight all kicking in to make this show more accessible to more people, which I very, very deeply appreciate. Um, we are talking to Mark today, so make sure you go and give Mark a follow on the old Twitter. Um, we're talking about replay in the specific, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, and then I'm working off of this set of examples here that we're going to go and play with. Um, did you want me to pull these up in the the replay browser? Uh, no, a uh, standard browser will do here. So uh, yeah, go ahead and pop open the, the React and Redux code sandbox there, the, the middle link up, next section up. Okay. Oops, well, the, uh, sorry, back. This one. Uh, yes, please. Got it. Okay, so so this is just the the bare basic React plus Redux counter example app as a code sandbox, and really the point here is to talk about what tools does even like the browser offer for general purpose debugging. Mm -hmm. So all all browsers today have a large suite of developer tools built in. Um, there's various ways to access it. For me, I usually just right click somewhere on the page and inspect element to open them up. Um, I personally usually end up popping this out as a separate window, but that's just me. Let's do so it. browser, so somewhere off on the side now. Um, so browsers and all the developer tools have a bunch of different tabs built in at this point. Um, usually there's an elements tab, which shows you the HTML structure of the page. Uh, there's, uh, let's see what, Trying to read the text there. Um, second tab is uh, console. Okay, yeah. So then you have your console, which outputs uh, whatever console logs are in the page, and also acts as an interactive interpreter. So you can try running expressions yourself, or typing in like the names of variables and seeing their contents. You've got the sources tab, which is your actual in-page debugger. And this lets you inspect the, the JavaScript files um, and actually do all that breakpoint type stuff. And, uh, and then you've got a show, a, a show of hand in the chat. Uh, anybody who's ever. How many of you have actually used page? that before? I have never used this page. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to put put a W in the chat if you've used it and an L in the chat if you have not. <laughs> Um, uh, and then you, usually you've got the network tab, which shows you how many network requests went and went on to what URLs, what kind of files, and how long they took. Um, then there is a performance tab where you can make a recording of the page and see like what JavaScript functions were running and what was taking up time. So these are all tools that are built into every browser at this point. Mm -hmm. So what I want to focus on for the moment is the sources tab and the JavaScript debugging experience specifically. Um, so Chad is over on the left, real silly with they've all used this tab before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So over on the left, we've got a, a file tree and mm -hmm. you'll see a bunch of different stuff in here. And that's because this page has loaded a lot of different things. There's the actual mm -hmm. application code. There's code sandboxes scaffolding for running this. And ver there's various other transformed versions of the code in here as well. Um, so in this case, uh, we can see that if you look at that top section that ends in .csb.app, that's mm -hmm. the real source code for this example. And you can see that we've got folders for both node modules and source. Uh, we can node module for now. But if we open up, say, uh, source slash features slash counter slash uh, counter slice dot ts. And part of the reason you're seeing a couple different versions in here is because JavaScript programs go through a build step. Everything gets mangled. Oh, and yeah. so we a, a typical build step also has to has to generate source maps 
which contain the original versions of the code. And so browsers can read those and show us the original code, and we can debug that, even though the minified messed up code is what's actually running in the page. Mm -hmm. So I, hopefully, in most cases, you've got source maps. You can see the original structure of the code. And from there, we can use fairly typical debugging tools. Now, most graphical debuggers have basically all of the same features and capabilities. You know, it's just a question like, where are those buttons located? So for example, one of the things you can typically do is you can add a breakpoint. And a breakpoint tells the JavaScript engine when the code is running and it gets to this line, stop, pause, halt, do not proceed further until we tell it to. So for example, let's scroll down to about line uh, 39-ish. And it said, there's a line that says state.value plus equals one. Mm -hmm. And typically the way you would add a breakpoint in most debuggers is you click right there on the line number or just to the left of it and it adds the little blue marker saying that there's a breakpoint on this line. Now it's just sitting there not doing anything. So let's interact with the page and make okay. something happen. Uh, over on the page, if you click the plus sign, oh. the click handler ran, it dispatched a Redux action, the Redux reducer is running, and because we got to this line, the browser is now paused. And so now we have, now we have the ability to look at the variables that exist in this portion of the page, um, and we can do the various stepping commands. Now, actually, as it turns out, this, this is probably not the greatest example because the Redux reducer is only one line. Mm -hmm. And due to the specific details of how Redux Toolkit is implemented, uh, even just looking at that state object is actually not all that helpful in this case. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, let's actually try something else. Uh, click on that breakpoint on line 39 to remove it and click the blue play icon in the lower left, just below the file tree. Resume yep. script execution. Yes. Yep. There it goes. So we, we, we told it, yep, stop pausing, keep running. So everything else kept going and the page updated. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's pause somewhere else. So uh, try opening up uh, the file counter.tsx. And again, we've got, we've got two of them. I think one of them, is is maybe italicized and i can never yeah, remember okay. which one which one is source mapped and which one is the the original version yeah it looks like italicized is the the version from the source map okay so let's let's try putting a breakpoint on line line 16. so kind of like just inside the pa the page and go ahead and click the the plus button again and at some point, the Redux, you know, everything updated and our React component is re-rendering and now we're paused inside here. So there's, there's a bunch of things we could do at this point. Um, one is that because we're paused, you can usually hover over variables in the page or in, in the editor and see what their current values are. So we're, we're just past the line that has count. So try hovering over count on line 15. Oh. And we can see that the current value is two. Uh, we can tell the JavaScript engine to advance further by using the various step buttons that are just below the file tree. And basically, every debugger has these buttons built in. Uh, and so the usual commands are play or resume to mm -hmm. keep going. There's a step over button which will advance to the next line. And if the next line is a function call, it, it goes past it and goes to the next line in this file. There's also a step in button to where if, if the next line is a function call, it'll jump from this file into the source code of the function that we're about to run. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a step out button, which if we're inside a function, will exit the function and go back up one level. Um, th 
depending on the debugger, there may be one or two other options here, but these are kind of like your fine grain control flow. So we are paused somewhere. I want to move forward bit by bit without just like hitting play. And so this using these doesn't require me to set up lots of different breakpoints. Once we've hit this breakpoint, these will, mm. will sort of allow me to navigate through the program from, from where the breakpoint starts. Right. So these are active when you are paused somewhere. Mm -hmm. And as long as, like, until we actually hit the run button again, we continue to pause at a line. And then we can step over, step over, step in, step out, etc. And again, like, every debugger has these. Visual Studio Code has them built in. Full-fledged Visual Studio, uh, WebStorm, Intel IntelliJ, IDEs. These are standard controls that every debugger for every language has mm -hmm. built in. There's also tools to let you see what the variables are in the local scope that we're looking at. So if you look in the lower right, there is a scopes panel. And we can see that right now we're kind of nested about three levels deep. Uh, this the current scope is is described as local and it's telling us for example like what is the value of the javascript this variable at the point in time well mm -hmm. right now it's pointing to window which is not very helpful but at least we know what it is it's showing us that count is two uh dispatch is in scope but it doesn't exist yet because we haven't gotten past the line that assigns it Right. Um, and then we've we've got several other variables that are declared. The JavaScript engine knows they will exist, but because they're you know declared with the const keyword, they they don't exist yet. Mm -hmm. So try hitting the step over button on the left, and we should see dispatch is now a function. And if you step again, we can see that because we just read those values from the React hook, now we've got increment amount and set increment amount. Mm -hmm. So those show us the variables that exist in this scope. And if you go expand the word block down there, it'll show us the variables at the, the next level out of the JavaScript scope. So you know we're we're inside the file which is inside the component, which maybe you know, is inside like an if statement or whatever. And so that, that shows you your levels of nesting in terms of available JavaScript declarations. So basically every debugger has a way to show you what variables exist at the code that you're currently paused at. And then there's also a watch tab next to that where you like maybe maybe you're going through back and forth between different functions or like you really only care about some certain variable names so you can type in variable names or even expressions like object like object one dot a dot b dot c mm -hmm. and every time you're paused it will try to evaluate that and it'll show you what the value is if it exists Got at it. that point in time and again, these are these are very common pieces of graphical debuggers that basically every GUI debugger has. Very cool. So like, yeah, so this stuff is built into Chrome and Firefox and you know whatever other browsers you may have. But if you were to open up Visual Studio Code or something else, you would see basically these same controls in different places, but basically these same capabilities available to you. Uh, another thing you can do is we've got the breakpoint there on line 15, and you can generally modify breakpoints. For example, maybe you've got it there, but you don't want to pause there the next time it runs. So you can right click and disable it. You can also make breakpoints conditional, like maybe I only want to pause if the count is currently, I don't know, two or something like that. So you can edit the breakpoint and add a condition value. So like, you know, count uh, count triple equals two or something like that. I think we're, are we already at? Let me set it to three so it actually. Confirm. We're, sure. Yeah. Right, because then it'll, it'll like run a couple times first. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So, so now it's. Uh, let's see, we'll also need to re-enable it. 
re-enable it. Okay, so it's enabled and, and it's hit, additional now. And, yep, so hit run because we're currently paused. Okay. So now and hit the two. plus sign again. And and remember, I set it to be at four, so it shouldn't do anything mm -hmm. this time. Yep. And it didn't. <laughs> and now that's, we hit it. That's, okay. So this is huge because one of the reasons that I haven't used breakpoints is because every time that I think they'd be useful, it's like in some looped operation where I'm like, I don't want to have to hit play mm -hmm. a thousand times. So this is a game changer. <laughs> I feel like you just changed my life, mm -hmm. Mark. And, and in fact, there are times when you might have like a half dozen breakpoints set. Right. You don't care about breakpoints two, three, four, five until the first one gets hit. So I might go in and disable the later ones, mm -hmm. make the first one conditional. Once that gets hit, then I go and re-enable the rest of them because now I actually care about pausing at those things. This still uh. can still be a bit of a pain, and that's one of the pain points that Replay solves, which we can get into in okay. just a minute. Okay, yeah. So I mean, in fact, th actually, is... actually, on that note, maybe maybe we got to switch over to replay here in just a second. Okay, I I do have it installed. I can uh, let me mm -hmm. just just pop it open, right? Sure. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so uh, the basic sales pitch for replay is it's like a DVR for and for recording your application. Uh, it does require that you use our special modified versions of uh, primarily Firefox now, but we are working on Chrome. We've got Chrome for Linux and Chrome for Mac and Windows are coming shortly. You open up the website, press the record button, use the website for a couple minutes, hit, hit save, it uploads it to the cloud, and then you go to our website, open up the recording, and start doing the time travel debugging thing. Okay. So I have like a million windows open here, but it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hopefully we can get the auth thing figured out. Wor worst case, we may end up, worst case, if we have to, we'll, we'll skip the recording step and go straight ahead to the like debugging a recording step. Okay. So, I okay. So, so here. it looks like, looks like you're signed in. Um, <laughs> the, the classic game of, of <laughs> hot dog, not hot dog. I am developer. Yep. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. So um, there's there's a bunch of possible example programs we could use here. Mm -hmm. um, tell you what, let's let's just op uh, let's open up that exact same React and Redux code sandbox link in here. Okay. Okay. So in the upper right, press the record button, and it'll reload the page. Okay, and now just click a few buttons, like click click plus a couple times, click minus once, click add amount, click add async, you know, uh, add if odd, you know, cl click plus and add if odd, decrement once. Okay, cool. Hit stop in the upper right, and fingers crossed that the magic cloud fairies do their thing. <laughs> okay. Okay, and while you're at it, uh, click the click the edit button down there. And let's uh, click the public access, and that way it's it's shared, and other people could open it up if they want to. Okay. All right. Uh, hit save. So we've made the recording. Ooh, hey, look, we've got our shiny new little tour on the left side that just got added within the last day or so. So I haven't really nice. even seen it myself. Um, we'll we'll skip that for now. Okay. Okay. So. We're now looking at Replay's at debugging application UI. So we've made a recording of the program, and we can now do the time travel debugging thing. The first thing we're looking at is viewer mode, which is basically a video playback. So if you click the little blue play icon in the lower left, it should show you like your mouse and all the actions that you took. It, it, it Basically, the video recording of what you did in the browser. So that part's cool, but the really interesting stuff to me as the person who you know works on it and cares about this is the debugging part. 
So okay. in the upper right, there's a switch tab. Click on DevTools. So what we see now basically looks and feels like the Firefox browser developer tools as a program because it basically is the Firefox browser developer tools as a program. Like our, our client side code base actually literally started as a copy paste of the Firefox dev tools source like two and a half years ago. Okay. Uh, we've, we've drastically, drastically rewritten it since then, but that, that was our starting point. Sure. So what we have now is basically the same kind of a debugger that we're, we were looking at in, in the browser a couple minutes ago, but with a bunch of extra features built in. So in the upper right, we've still got that video playback. So wherever we're paused in the recording, we can see what the page looked like. Um, so let's, let's do this. Um, over on the left side, the middle icon that looks like your, your typical file icon should bring up the list of sources. And this is the, you know, basically the same list we were looking at a minute ago. Uh, so let's open up the uxb.app source and let's open up counterslice.ts. Okay, so now we're looking at the source code for one of the files. You know, this is the, the Redux logic that's in here. And the first thing that I want you to notice is that we've got not just line numbers on the left side, but we've got a bunch of little blue uh, numbers in there. These are hit counts. This tells you oh. how many times each line ran during the recording. And look, so yeah, like down just here by I'm doing stuff, mm -hmm. I can see that we called increment three times. All right, okay. So just by opening up this file, I start to get a sense of what code ran and what didn't. And that can be that can be a big deal because that that starts to fit into the mental model question. Like maybe I know that we were supposed to go inside an if statement, but that line doesn't have any indication that it ran. Or maybe I thought this loop was supposed to execute five times and it actually ran like five thousand times. That's that's not supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. So like the meaning will be very dependent on what it is you're trying to investigate, but. Just being it's, able to visualize like, how many times is useful. Yeah, it's very coarse signal, right? Like it, it, one of the first mm -hmm. things we're trying to do is disqualify things that that aren't the problem, because you know, at, at first thing is like something's broken. It could be any line of code in the app. So the first thing we have to do is disqualify a bunch of things that we don't need to check, and having mm -hmm. a quick visual indicator like this that oh, the code that was supposed to run didn't run. I don't need to debug the yep. code. I need to debug why it didn't run. <laughs> Like okay, I, that, so in that's a huge problem too. Is like mm -hmm. I, I, for me at least, a huge number of the bugs that made me want to throw my laptop out a window were because I thought I was debugging something that wasn't actually the thing that was running, right? And mm -hmm. so this would have probably saved me hours of my life, and I might still have hair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've earlier we talked about GUI debugging. And the other main technique, as you pointed out, is print debugging. So, you know, JavaScript, you're adding console log statements. Python, you're adding the keyword print. You know, Java system out dot print line. But just like in my actual application code, I write real code that prints some tech. Like, you know, got to this line plus variable one plus variable two. Mm -hmm. And that, that serves a couple purposes. It gives us wayfinding so we know what code did or did not run. It gives us a sense of a timeline so that I know that this line of code ran before that line of code. Uh, we're looking at the values of variables as they existed at certain points of time. Mm -hmm. And the biggest problem, it, it is an incredibly valuable technique. And you, know, you, you pointed out earlier that you, like, you've, you've basically relied on print debugging in most of your career. I find that both print debugging and GUI debuggers are equally useful tools that are valuable for different situations. Um, and, and having both of those tools in my toolbox is incredibly important. Uh, just within the last couple of days. Um, so I've actually been spending this last week working on a, a pull request 
that will include those source map files in the build system for the React library, because React does not currently ship with source maps, which means that when you get production errors, it's always that minified you know, gibberish right. for the error message. Right, right. Or like if you step out of your component, you're in the middle of React's code and well, okay, fine. It doesn't make much sense even if you have source maps, but at least it makes slightly less nonsense. <laughs> um, so I'd, I'd, I'd gotten React's build system updated to include source maps, but tools like V and Next weren't picking them up correctly. And so I was trying to figure out why. And I actually went into node modules in a Vite project and was adding console.log statements to the code for other libraries to figure out what it was doing, mm -hmm. what file paths it was looking at to try to find the source map files on disk, and what it was or was not finding. Which, okay, so two points there. One, you can totally edit code in node modules and add log statements. That is a real thing you can do. Mm -hmm. And second, that that was a time where print statements were useful and a GUI debugger was probably not so much. So th these are both valuable techniques to have. Yes. Okay, so, but the, pr the problem is though, you have to have those in the code before it runs. Right. To print things out, unless you're using replay. So, there on, uh, was it line 39-ish, where we've got the, the state dot value plus equals one? Mm -hmm. If you hover over that line, there's the little red plus hover icon. Mm -hmm. Click that. This is what we call a print statement. It is basically your console log type debugging, except we just added it to the recording. And if you look over on the right side, we've got our version of the browser console. And you can see that it printed out three different lines because this line of code ran three different times. Now, by default, it's showing us the name of the function and the line number that it's on. But the line number isn't all that interesting. Mm -hmm. What if we replace the line number with state.value so that we can see like what was the number before we added one to it. Wow. So the very first time we came in there, it, it was at the start of the program. So state.value was still a zero. Right. And then we added one. And then you came in there again and it was one and we're about to add it to its two. And then you did some other things and we came back to it and it was, what is that, six? And now it's seven right because okay this was the this was me pushing like different buttons right? mm -hmm. yeah so let's let's try adding another one try adding one inside of the decrement handler and we can we can do the same thing like state dot value here and okay so i can i can see that we did that after these other things uh what happens if we put one inside of the increment by amount Handler. Oh, wait, wait. Now I want to get clever. Mm -hmm. There you go. So there's, there's multiple things to take away from this. One is that we are adding that print logging after the fact. None of this existed in the code of the application at all, but I've got my recording and I can start to go in and add those print statements. Second, if you look at the console, it's starting to form that visual timeline of I did thing A, I did thing B, I did thing A again. We can customize the print statements to have whatever message or variable evaluations we want. And we're, we're getting that sense of progression. Okay. Uh, let's, let's try this. So okay. we, before we move on, can I just, okay. Do you ever, okay. Please. Do you ever see a tool and it, you're just like irritated? Like I'm irritated at how good this is. <laughs> like this is, this is something that what, like, of course this should exist. Of course this is mm -hmm. going to be immensely valuable. And the fact that like, if I can, I'm assuming if I hit this share, 
and I do anyone with the link and I copy. Yeah, it's, it's already I think it's, it's already it's already set to public because we had we'd hit that checkbox earlier. Okay. And so now I'm throwing this back to everybody on the on the chat. Like, mm-hmm. go go check this out. And now other folks other link, folks can come in here. Yeah. Yeah, and here people are coming in now. I can see them in here. Um now uh let me maybe not show the comments just in case people decide to be naughty. Um <laughs> But uh, but th- like this is just th- th- this is this is the sort of thing that if I knew how to build it, I would have built it. But I didn't, so I assumed it was mm. impossible. And now that it exists, and, and I'm irritated that I didn't use it like yeah. as soon as it was available. So I, I I have a bunch of thoughts on this topic too. Um, one is that there there is some serious serious deep magic type of engineering that is happening in the cloud to make this possible. Uh, we we have articles linked from our documentation about some of the technical levels of how the recording process and the playback stuff works. Um, there is like serious engineering going on to make it possible. Does real and it works. Uh, an- another point is that okay, yes, look, I'm I'm an employee of the company. I'm here talking about this thing that my company builds, and we would like to, you know like to have people you know companies pay us money to use this. Um, it is free for individuals. It is free for open source projects. Um, we, but on top of that, like, I genuinely firmly believe that this is like a revolutionary advance in being able to debug. I I have full faith in the project and the company as a useful tool. That is why I joined this company in the first place, because I have burned hundreds and thousands of hours of my career debugging things. I know how valuable this tool would have been if I'd had it years ago. I want to build this thing that will save developers time. Mm. And I am excited at how much, like there are so many things we can build that we haven't, like we've barely even scratched the surface of that. I And I can show you a couple of those in a minute. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the sort of thing that it it um, it's it's like the first time I saw wheels on a suitcase. You know, I mm. like I was carrying my heavy bag, and I saw somebody go by with their suitcase on wheels, and I was just pissed. <laughs> I was like, "Why didn't I think of that? That's such a good idea." <laughs> mm. So okay, so this is this is great. So uh, we have, have thus far just to recap and get us back on track. We use the app. Uh, in the replay browser while recording, which allowed me to get this snippet, which uh, I've I've shared. We can see some folks from the chat have joined, and they're looking at this themselves. I'm looking at the source uh, in this this source window here, and I've added not breakpoints but console logs to something that happened in the past, which is basically allowing me to go back in time and change how the program ran which lets me console log information on a previous run. So yep. already extraordinarily cool. What else can we do here? Okay. Oh boy, we have so many things that we don't have time for. Okay, so I'll try to hit a couple of the highlights. Um, okay, so item one, if you look at the, the print statement that we have inside the increment case, you'll see the little timeline at the bottom of the print statement that mm-hmm. says this, this that line of code ran three times. Right now, we are paused at the end of the recording, and you can see that by looking at the bottom timeline and the little red dot is all the way over to the end. So item one, we can jump to any point in time in the in the recording just by clicking on that bot- big timeline at the bottom. So like just, just try clicking somewhere in the middle of the timeline. And if you look at the video preview, you can see that you know at that time the counter was six. If you click somewhere else in the timeline, it'll show you, you know, the counter was, you know, zero, whatever. And we can see the video preview change, the little red line in our console that indicates where you are in that sequence changes. So you can jump to any point in time and inspect things. Uh, You'll notice that we've got the same kind of tabs as the browser developer tools. So for example, if you click on the elements tab, Uh, This is your same HTML elements thing, except it's showing you what was in the page at that point in time. And yes, you can pick 
elements and drill down and see, you know, here's what my HTML was at that point in time. That is huge. Uh, we also have the React DevTools integrated. So if you click on the React tab, and this is actually something I didn't, we didn't get to earlier. Um, I, I guess we're gonna, gonna kind of skip past the React and Redux DevTools portion of this demo. Um, there are React and Redux browser extensions, and you mm -hmm. install them in your browser. And when you open up a page that has React or Redux inside of it, they will show you stuff that's happening in the page. Like just like not even replay, just you install them in your browser. They add tabs to the DevTools panel. And so like with React, the extension shows you what, what is my React component tree in the page. Mm -hmm. With Redux, it shows you here's my actions over time, state over time, et cetera. From there, we have integrated the React DevTools into replay and what you're looking at here is the React component tree at that point in time, the same way we were just looking at the HTML elements tree at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So this is the same thing you would see if you were looking at your browser, except it'll, it, it would update as we jump back and forth through the timeline. Right. Uh, I also have a, a small proof of concept of doing the same thing for Redux. There's still some pieces that need to be integrated with that, but I've, I've proven it's possible. Okay, so in that print statement timeline on the left, we've got the three little blue dots indicating that that line of code ran three times. Mm -hmm. uh, try either clicking on one of the little blue dots or clicking the little left and right arrows. Okay. So right now we're paused on the third time this line of code ran. And because we're paused on that spot, we now have our standard browser step debugger controls available and we can hover over things. In fact, I'll tell you what, slightly better example, uh, let's go down to the increment by amount case mm -hmm. and click one of those dots. Try hovering over the word action in the code. Uh, like on line 40, what, 40, 46 ish, somewhere around there. Just hover over the word action. And in the same way that you could do that in a browser dev tools, we're seeing the, the contents of that variable in scope at that point in time. So cool. Okay, so over on the left side, um, the next to the last icon in the left sidebar has a pause icon with a little red dot. Mm -hmm. Click that. So oh, here's where you have your, your browser. Here, here's where you have your browser debugger controls. So the top row, we have the same step in, step out, step over. There's also a step backwards button. Come on. <laughs> This is, I mean, this is so good. So, so we can like try it. Now we're at, notice we mm -hmm. just went to seven when I clicked it. Okay. Now I'm going to go back. Yep. And now. Wait, oh, look, we're, we're inside Redux toolkit because that's what called this function. Oh, cool. Okay. Okay. This is just, this is very, very cool stuff. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm pretty. And, and so if I want to step out, this will take me back up to my code, right? Uh, yeah, we're, we're probably somewhere else in the call stack at this point. Um, so here, here's another one. Uh, go, <laughs> okay, go, go back, go back to the, con go back to the console tab and, yep. uh, and hover over one of those entries and click the little blue pop fly out button. And it'll jump us back to the line of code where we had that print statement and the time that that message got printed. So, you know, being able to net, it's that, that's another way to jump back and forth. Uh, so the other, the other stuff, the other stuff over in the left sidebar shows us like the list of the print statements we have and what files they're in. Um, it shows us the call stack, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the function calls where we're paused right now. There's that same scopes panel that shows us the variables as they mm -hmm. exist right now. So again, your, your standard debugger controls. Uh, here's another thing we can do. 
one of the great things about replay, like I talked earlier about sharing replays back and forth, like maybe the QA person recorded it or someone has done some previous investigating. Um, on the right side of the print statement panel, try clicking the red pl uh, plus comment icon, um, just right of where you've got it saying state.value. Mm -hmm. Click that and just say, I don't know, we're, we're inside increment by amount or something like that. <laughs> okay. And that comment is now part of the replay and anyone else who opens this up will see it. And so frequently, like my teammates and I, like someone starts to investigate a problem. They say, okay, like we, we went to this line and I found this, we went to another line and I found that. And then someone else can open up the replay, see what that other person has done and kind of trace their thoughts. Now, is this comment tied to time? Uh, because we made it, on a print statement, when we were paused there, it is tied to both the line of code and the time that code got hit. Oh, that's cool. So, so if, if I was doing my looping thing and I have you know a million things and I find the one that's broken, I can comment and say, this is where it breaks, mm -hmm. and then jump exactly. right to that point in execution. Yep. Oh, so good. Okay. All right, uh, we are we are running shorter on time. Yes, I want I want to show off I want to show off some fancy new features that I that I personally have built that I'm really excited about. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so uh, still still there in the replay UI. Um, okay. Uh, on the left side, the upper left icon with the uh, the little I symbol. Um, so this is our general information panel and like up in the upper left, it says who recorded it, what page were you looking at, et cetera. And then we've got this list of events below it. Mm -hmm. And originally this was just kind of informational. And if you clicked on it, we knew the time that these happened, but we didn't know like what code ran in response. Okay. So like, like we know that a click happened, but what happened when that click? I don't know. Nobody knows. So I have added some extra analysis code that looks at the click and tries to figure out what piece of application code ran when you clicked that button. So fingers crossed, try clicking the little blue flyout button on the right side. Come on, magic. Oh, hey, look, it's the on click handler for the plus button. So cool. I mean, it's like, and if and if you were to do that for the others, it should hopefully jump you to the places where those ran. I think we we clicked we, we clicked increment one. a few times. Yeah, and then we end up yep. on the uh, add amount, and then I think I clicked mm -hmm. decrement, maybe or yeah, we ended up. Nope, on uh, we're, we're down a little async. further. Yep, and then yeah, this is this is just. It, very cool. Uh, the added and and the, and the way I and the way I did this is our back end exposes an API, and our front end uses that API for everything you've seen thus far. Mm -hmm. That's how we built like the stack frames panel and the consoles and all that stuff. But over the last few months, we've been able to start building deeper analysis by being able to say like, okay, let's let's ask questions about the execution of the code and find out interesting information and use that to build nifty new features. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's another there's another brand new one that I just added. It is still very, very experimental. And in fact, I just merged a PR this morning that, that it, it had gotten accidentally removed and I, I re-added it. So all the fingers are crossed right now. Uh, in the <laughs> upper right, in it, we, there's a there's a there's a triple dot hamburger icon next to dev tools go to settings and click experimental on the left scroll all the way to the bottom and click enable react panel okay okay close this and there's a new I react icon on the left side fingers crossed okay what this is trying to do is we, we did a bunch of interacting with the page. 
we we clicked buttons, those dispatched Redux actions, those caused React to re-render. Mm -hmm. And you know, frequently, like I'm paused with a breakpoint inside of a React component, and I know that my component is rendering, but I have no idea like what even started the render process in the first place. Mm -hmm. Like maybe I'm I, I'm inside a component that's like all the way down my component tree. And this component rendered because it's parent rendered because it's parent because it's parent because something called set state right up here. Now we don't have any of the correlation capability yet, but what I tried to figure out is can I determine when your code called something resembling React's set state function somewhere? Okay. So Hover over that first on click and do the and click the the jump button. And it should actually end up taking us to the same place. Mm -hmm. And you know what? This this example isn't necessarily it isn't necessarily all that great because this is a relatively simple application. Um but I've proven that this works with like just a just a plain React set state call. It usually works with dispatching a Redux action as well. And so, like, this is still very experimental. Like, the analysis logic relies on digging into a lot of React's internals, which could potentially change at some point in the future. Right. Um, it relies on me having me knowing certain things about the way React works and kind of working backwards from that. Um, and we don't even know, like, what is the right way to present this information or make it useful yet? This is like the sure. first proof of concept that like, can we even build something like this right now? Right, yeah. But but I was able to whip up basically the first working version of that in like four hours. Very. I mean, that's cool that you've got the, the pieces here, right? That you're able to, to mm -hmm. do this much. Like, th these are all things that individually I would be kind of, I, I don't know how I would even start because like what we're, you know, as you said, like there's some pretty hardcore engineering that goes into not just like introspecting an app, but like observing it as it runs and being able to modify it in a non-breaking way as it runs so that I mm -hmm. as a developer can do actual debugging that's not like imaginary, like this is, we're not hallucinating what's happening in the mm. app we're just running the code but we can attach these sort of like you, you've kind of given us like what middleware for code execution <laughs> if that makes it pretty like much yeah i mean it's it's very very cool that that this is possible um so mm. i know that you have a lot to show and i don't want to, to keep you from doing it but i i do have a couple questions about um so we we've mainly looked at ask react. away yeah so we, we mainly looked at mm. react and I, so my two points of curiosity are one, do you need to have the replay browser to use one of these recordings and, and kind of inspect? So uh, there's two different answers to that question. So the way our recording technology works is we fork in the software development process sense, the actual browsers. We have our own version of the Chrome repo, our own version of the Firefox repo, mm -hmm. and we've added you know, thousands of lines of C++ and JavaScript to the actual browsers to enable making these recordings. Because what we're actually capturing is at the operating system level. So every time the browser opens up a socket, every time it receives network data, every time it makes a call to like a, a C library math random function, every one of those bits of external interaction get recorded. That's what's saved. And then we can basically rerun the browser process in the cloud and feed it back all yeah. the information that got recorded. So if you made the recording at three o'clock on Firefox 97 in Japan, when it's rerunning, it thinks it's three o'clock on Firefox 97 in Japan. Sure. Now let's talk about the hard stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's that, that that's the deep magic engineering I'm talking about. Now, once you've once you've made the recording, once you've made the recording, what we're looking at right now is just a normal 
Next.js React Redux application. You can do the debugging in any browser, Firefox, Chrome, whatever. It doesn't matter what it was used to record it. It's just, this is, this is a website. I'm looking at the website and using it. Um, right. And so okay. this, it, it does get back to like, right now our primary recording browser is Firefox because both of the founding engineers were Firefox dev tools developers. Got it. We are working on Chromium support. We have Chrome for Linux basically working. It's still missing some pieces. And the runtime engineers are building, starting to build out support for Chrome for Mac and, and Windows over the next few months. So our plan is that within, within the next few months, Chrome will be our primary recording browser. And that's what most people would use. Um, Very cool. Another, okay. another point I'll make with that is we have an, a, a feature that we're working on. So what we did here was we made a manual recording. Mm -hmm. We opened up the recording browser, hit, hit the record button, use the app, et cetera. We are working on integration with Playwright and Cypress end-to-end -end test suites. So the idea, and that's especially where like the Chrome for Linux stuff comes in. So mm -hmm. the idea is you configure your end-to-end -end test suite job to do the, to run those tests using our recording browser. And then you push a PR, it kicks off your end-to-end -end tests, 50 tests go run, and we make recordings of all of those. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Replay's dashboard, like you've got the list of the, you know, the recordings that you personally have made, mm -hmm. but there's also a test suites view that shows you that okay, we push this PR and uh, you, you won't see that view because you don't, you're not part of a test suites team at the moment. Right, right, um, right. But, there, but there is a view here that basically shows you, okay, here's the PR. It was pushed, the branch name, that ran 50 tests, 47 passed, three failed. Here's the recordings for all of them. And now you can pop open those recordings and debug the failing end-to-end -end test even though it happened in like a GitHub Actions VM somewhere. That's real cool. Um, and it, it, you know, it just kind of like builds on the promise of, of what tools like Cypress have been getting us closer and closer to. And, and you know, the, the idea that Cypress will show us what went wrong and now Replay will use Cypress to not only show us, but then let us go in and tinker with it. Um, that mm -hmm. is very, I mean, it just gets us closer and closer to like, being able to effectively go into your user's machine and like just try stuff there instead mm -hmm. of asking them to, you know, well, what browser was it? What, what, you know, it, it feels like we're building closer and closer to these things mm -hmm. being just possible. Um, so, okay. We have about five, ten minutes, minutes left. left. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had okay. one other question before we continue which was we focused Shoot. a lot on React, but I just want to make sure, is this is yeah. this kind of for any any app debugging? Yes. So because we do the recording at the browser level, mm -hmm. we record everything that happens in the browser. So we a lot of our developer experience, our, our features are kind of focused on React because, because we use React. React right. is very popular. Um, but you can use this to debug any code that runs in the browser. Um, and so like, it doesn't matter if you're using Vue, Angular, Svelte, Solid, Vanilla JS, whatever, uh, Backbone. In fact, um, my, our, our CEO, Jason, has gone off and like recorded random websites. Like we, we found a bug oh. in, what was it, StubHub's Backbone code a while back just by recording, like just by recording their own checkout flow. Very cool. Very, very cool. Okay, so with our with our last 10 minutes, what do you want to show? Okay, so I, I've done all this, and we've, we've talked about all these features. I could talk about them for a lot, a lot more, but the last thing I want to show off is the potential of replay that we have barely even begun to scratch. So if you go back to that gist, um, the, the next to the last link under other resources. Uh, let's see, it was in here. Other resources. Uh, it, there is a replay protocol examples repo. Go clone that repo locally real fast. Okay. Um, let's get a 
Oh boy, I have. You know, I got you by thinking. Entire, in, in, entire, entirely too many project folders. Yeah. Um, let's go with git clone. Is it gonna let me do? Oh no, no, no! I'm trying to be fast and it's making me slow. I, th I think you can just clone the HTTP URL in this case, but we'll see. We'll see if this that, works. Yeah, okay. 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 So I, I mentioned a few minutes ago, Replay's backend has an API, and yes. that's how we do all the work. And we, we've built all these magical features on the front end using that API. This repo demonstrates a couple non-Replay front end app examples of talking to the uh, to that API and doing okay. other things with it both to demonstrate the basic concepts and it's kind of a hey look what you could do let your imagination run wild mm -hmm. so um go ahead and open that open up that folder in a vs code if you could and yep. also uh in the terminal go into the coverage extractor folder and run yarn oh do i have yarn i do okay good <laughs> okay cool so i i wrote this a few i, I wrote this uh i don't know middle of last year so earlier we saw the hit counts feature. If you open up one of the files in replay, it shows you how many times each line of code got hit. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure you've seen test runners like Jest have like a dash dash coverage option that will tell you right. like, you know, 87% of the lines of code in this file got hit. You should probably increase your test coverage, et cetera. And the coverage reporting can usually be done in several ways. One is printed out at the console as part of the, the test output, but there's you, could, you can often have them spit out an HTML file containing like the structure of the source code tree and the contents of each file and the how many times did each line of code run information in the HTML file so that you've got like an artifact that you can look at later. And it occurred to me why what would happen if I smashed these two ideas together? I've got hit count information from our API. Right. I know what libraries get used to generate the HTML files. What if I tried doing both of those? So I wrote a small example script that does this, and I hopefully have it configured correctly. Uh, do, a, do a yarn start, fingers crossed. Oh no, did oh. I oh drat. Did I did I not I don't think I put did I not push the change? Uh give me give me just a second here. I'm going to try to oh, drat. Um actually, you know what? Let's let's do this. I I don't even know the, the right way to just send you the, the ID at the moment. Um in in your browser, let's go back to replay where we're looking at the code sandbox example. And if you if you look at the URL, right after app dash dash is a GUID all the way up to the question mark. So like from the C9 whatever to the question mark. Got it. Okay, copy that, copy that. And go back to the VS Code terminal, uh, yarn start, and then paste in that recording ID. And I'm hoping this is going to work. Please, please. It's yeah, there we things. go. It's okay. doing things. It's it's uh, it's actually doing too much. Um, okay, we're gonna fix this real fast. Hit Control C. Open up the source code. I love this. We're gonna fix this because I, I I I fix I fixed this locally earlier and I forgot to push it. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, open up uh, main.ts. Scroll down about twenty lines, and uh, keep going. There's a spot where we're doing some string checks. Uh, okay, uh, line 55, um, add an exclamation mark in front of the double equal webpack. Okay. Okay, hit save. Um, we're, the problem is that because this was in a sandbox, it was picking up some of code sandboxes files and I want mm -hmm. to exclude those. Okay. Uh, so tr try this again. And fingers crossed. Okay, that looks better. That looks like a list of just the actual source code files. Okay, 
Um, pull up pull up a file explorer in this folder because we're going to open up an HTML file off disk in the browser. Okay. Uh, there is a coverage folder in there. And open up index.html in the browser. Yeah. Okay. And there's our HTML code coverage report. Okay. And if you click on, say, source features counter, counter slice, there is the source code contents with the hit counts. So, like, we never hit the failed state. Yep. Cool. So, so, so again, to, to clarify, what I did was we we used the same API from our oh. back end that our front end uses to build all the features. I asked it, what was the list of source files in this recording? For every one of those, give me the source code contents right. and the hit count information. Mm. And then I took the same HTML code coverage report library that just uses, mm -hmm. and I figured out how to format that hit count data in the same data structures that it needs, and I generated code coverage. That's so cool. So that that shows us what code ran in this recording. Mm -hmm. And like even that by itself is maybe sort of useful. It's I mean, it's super useful, right? Like again, if 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 I expected that some data manipulation was gonna run, it could be that it's running and not working, or it could be that I screwed up and forgot to call it in the first place. And being able to very mm -hmm. quickly gut check that I did in fact call the code I thought I was calling is a huge time saver. You know, it, it, even even if it's not a huge time saver, it saves me a few cycles, and those cycles add up. Um, mm. With that, Mark, we are out of time, so I'm going to oh. send everyone to. You. <laughs> I'm going to send everybody to your Twitter. Uh, I'm going to send everyone to the replay website. And what other resources should people be looking for if they want to go give this a try and get started? Um, the, the, the best page to get started with, uh, in our docs is HTTPS colon slash slash replay dot IO slash record dash bugs. We've, we've got a short link to the page. Um, so replay dot IO, yep. Record dash bugs. Yeah, it'll, it'll redirect to that particular page, but that works. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's the biggest thing there. Um, and then I, I, I linked it in the GIST, but I have a talk with slides that I've done about debugging, which expands on a lot of these principles of, you know, thinking your way through the problem, scientific, you know, hypothesis, um, a bunch of specific techniques for JavaScript and React and Redux, et cetera. Awesome. All right. So uh, we have had live captioning here. Maggie's been here all day from White Coat Captioning. Thank you so much, Maggie. And that is made possible through the support of our sponsors, Netlify, NX, New Relic, and Plural Site. Uh, while you're checking out things on the site, make sure you go and take a look at the schedule. We've got an absolute banger of a schedule coming up. Uh, it's we've got we're going to do some real user measurement stuff, which will pair really nicely. Ooh, you've with what got we just talked about today. Uh, we've got Sunil coming on to talk about his new venture party kit, which is like real time collaborative, just super super fun stuff. Um, and Sunil is always good for talking about the future of things. And then Mark DeBassi, Finite Singularity, is coming on to talk about doing just shaders and OBS and cool stuff that will make this stream hopefully more fun for everybody. I've, I've been watching what, what Mark's been working on, and it's very, very cool. And I've got some episodes that I haven't even put up on the on the schedule yet, so make sure you head over there, check them out, get, get the thing, subscribe on YouTube, do whatever it is that you got to do. Y'all, this has been a blast. Mark, any parting words before we call this one done? Really, my main advice here is, like, you can learn how to debug. You should learn how to debug. It'll be a huge boost for your career. Um, there's there's all the general purpose debugging stuff that you can and should learn. And then in my very obviously biased opinion, everyone who is doing web development should try out Replay and see how much time time travel debugging can save you wise words all right y'all uh thank you all for hanging out mark thank you so much for taking time with us today and we will see you all next time